Okay, so this is uh, elders, deacons, preachers, and saints. This is lesson number six. The title of this one is Appointing uh, Elders. Let's uh, do a little uh, review, shall we? I always like to kind of go back over uh, the previous lesson, give us an idea of the things that we've talked about so far. So, so far we've said that different people have specific roles to which they are appointed based on their ability and their character, when we're talking about elders, that is. And in the past, uh, or in the post-apostolic period, these roles uh, are those of elder, uh, deacon, preachers. Of course, we have also the role of evangelist, same thing as uh, preacher. And we've said that uh, those are the only kind of appointed roles that the New Testament uh, talks about, gives information concerning, like uh, if, you, if you look at different uh, churches, different groups, they have all kinds of different roles, superintendent and you know, uh, archbishop and all kinds of roles that have been created since that time. Uh, but our, um, uh, our position uh, concerning these things are that these roles were created by, by man and not necessarily uh, supported by any uh, scripture. That's why the title of the series is Elders, Deacons, Preachers, Saints. Those are the roles that the, that the Bible uh, talks about and those are the roles that we're studying in our series. Another thing we said is that in the discussion about elders, we, we've said the following. Jesus is the only head of the church. He, he is, there's no one who is co-head with Jesus. Only Jesus is the head of the church. Uh, but his leadership is exercised in the local congregation through the eldership. Also said that elders are men who possess general and specific qualifications that are well described in the Bible. There's no mystery about that. They're very, uh, very clear in the New Testament what the characteristics and qualities are. And we said they possess them to the degree that they are recognized by others. Remember we said how hospitable, how you know, how self-controlled, how, you know, just how much do you have to have a certain quality in order to qualify? And the answer to that, well, you have that quality to the degree that others recognize it in you. That's a good way to confirm that you, uh, that you are growing spiritually and you have the, the type of character that, uh, uh, that uh, enables you to serve as an elder. We also said that the Bible says that the main work of elders is threefold. First of all, to protect against false teaching and teachers. Secondly, to promote and direct sound teaching, good works, unity, peace. Make sure that the church is functioning uh, in unity and peace. And of course, to provide an example of leadership as mature Christians. That's, those are the, ta the main tasks uh, of elders uh, outlined in the New Testament. So those are some of the things we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Today I'd like to finish the section on elders by looking at the different ways that elders are selected and review some ideas about the wives of elders, because the Bible also talks about the elder's wife. Now, most of the scripture references in the New Testament referring to elders describes either their character, their work, or a situation where they are already serving in this capacity. In other words, examples of them functioning as elders. There are only two passages, to my knowledge, uh, that deal with how a man becomes an elder. One passage is an example and the other passage is a command. So let's take a look at those two passage, passages. rather. In Acts chapter 14, verse 23, it says, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord uh, whom, they had, uh, whom they had believed. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. So this example here is uh, when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey through Lystra and Iconium, Antioch, the Bible says that they appointed elders, notice plural, in every, in every church. Not a lot of information, you know, four or five lines of information there. And you know when we say the Bible teaches us through command or example, there's an example. An example of what the apostle was doing in not just planting a church, but helping to mature that church. 
And so we see them appointing elders. There's an example of how elders gained their position. They were appointed to those positions, in this case, uh, by the apostle. The second passage is in Titus chapter one, verse five. And here Paul says to Titus, he's, uh, and Titus was a, an evangelist, he says, for this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. There's a command. You know, Paul is saying, remember what I told you to do? I told you to make sure to, to organize the church and, you know, and then to appoint elders in every city as I directed you. There's a command. I told you, an evangelist, this is what you're supposed to do. Okay? And probably, he says, set things in order and appoint elders as I directed you. The directions he gave them are probably the directions that are in 1 Timothy. Because in 1 Timothy we have a much longer list you know, of the qualifications of the elder and so on and so forth. So he's saying to another young evangelist, you know what I said to Timothy? Well, you do the same. You appoint elders according to the information that I have already given. There are no other passages that give us any information about this particular matter. So based on what we have, we've got these two. Here are some conclusions and directions regarding our own selection of elders. And this brings up another point, you know, why do we do what we do in the church, Church of Christ? You know, we, we, don't, we don't extrapolate and create more stuff. We go by what we have. We have this. We have these two passages that give us direction on how to select elders. And so from this, we can surmise, first of all, that is that that elders being appointed is not a democratic exercise. It's not politics. We're not, we're not, we're not, you know, we don't look for a man who's popular necessarily. It's not a vote. You know, uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, when Brother Harold became an elder, you know, well, you know, he, two, two, you know, 64 people voted for him. Uh, whoa, 71 people voted against him. I don't think he got enough vote. You know, that's politics. That's not church. So elders are not voted on. They're not volunteered either by the congregation. It's not a democratic exercise of the church selecting a man by majority vote. He's appointed. There's a difference. So then we go to the second thing that we learn. So how do they get to where they are? Well, they're chosen, they're raised up, they're appointed. So we can say chosen or appointed. Appointed means to raise up. Or ordained, we use that term, means to set alongside. Well, who does that? Well, the existing leadership that has itself been appointed. By whom? Well, in the Bible we see they're appointed by apostles, perhaps. And in, first, in Titus, we see that Titus, the evangelist, what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to appoint elders. So there we have you know, an example of how to, how to do this thing. So in a church that has no elders, but has a preacher, well then the preacher's role, among other things, is to raise up men according to the qualifications that he sees in the Bible who will eventually serve as elders. And when he feels they are ready, he appoints them to the eldership. Why do it that way? Well, that's what Timothy was, uh, that's what Titus was doing. So I, I think I'm in good company if I do, as a preacher, if I do what Titus is doing, I think I've got some support there for, for my actions. So as I say, in a church, where there are no elders and you have a preacher, well then the preacher, it's his responsibility. Not just to walk around and say, hey, would you like to be an elder, would you? No. His responsibility is to, I, I call it scouting, you know, search for men who have a zeal for the Lord, a zeal for service, you know, begin raising them up, training them so that they can one day take over that, that role. Now, in a church where there are elders, they have been appointed, well, who do you think appoints the preachers? 
Well, the elders appoint the preachers. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, right? How was Timothy the preacher selected? Well, through the laying on of the hands of who? The elders. So you notice this cycle here? The apostles appoint elders. The elders appoint preachers who go out and, 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 and plant churches and appoint elders in those churches. And those elders in those churches, what do they do? Well, they appoint more preachers who go out and plant more churches. And you know, the cycle works in that way. Of course, the new elders are established according to the qualifications and the guidelines already set forth in the New Testament. So we've got the information concerning the kind of person that we're looking for. And we have a mechanism for putting them in place according to the examples and the commands that have been given us by the inspired apostles. So we don't need more than that to establish local leadership in the church. So leaders are responsible to seek out and train and appoint other elders. And you know, we, we've done that here. You know, we, 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 we look for the feedback from the congregation, obviously, when we're not just elders, but deacons. You know, we want to know, you know, well, we, you know, when we've uh, uh, established new elders, We've let the congregation know, we're thinking that this brother and this brother will hopefully serve us as elders, and before they're appointed, we want feedback from the congregation. Have you recognized in them those qualities that we think they have? And do you know something that we, meaning the elders, do we, do, does the congregation know of a reason why this man cannot serve as an elder? Is there something that you know that we don't know that would disqualify him? So we use that mechanism, kind of a safety mechanism, to make sure that we know as much as we can know concerning a man and his life and so on and so forth. And those who aspire to be elders, even though they may have refused in the past or felt that they were too young or they doubt their qualifications, it's still okay to express a desire to serve in this role. Remember we said the very first qualification is the desire to serve the Lord in this capacity. So when qualified men seek the eldership and express their desire to the preacher or to the eldership, it's the first step in the process of adding elders to, to God's church. Very important. You know, at some time, we here, we'll need more elders in this congregation. And uh, I hope that this, you know, this series will encourage our present elders in their work and stimulate others, of course, to desire the work uh, of elders for the glory of God. We always need new elders. And I've said before, just because a man is put into position to serve as an elder doesn't mean he's an experienced elder. It means, okay, he's ready to serve, but it still takes a couple of years before that individual kind of grows into that role. All right, so, let's, uh, so we've kind of you know, gone over a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these issues about elders, and that was the last thing that I wanted to touch on about you know, how, do we, how do we find them. So let's talk a little bit about the wife of the elder. Um, I think any elder uh, is going to tell you that a good part of the success in the work of elderding or shepherding belongs to his wife. Very important, it's a partnership. Um, I remember once uh, when I was having a meeting with a, a group uh, for a, a particular uh, work and there were uh, you know, some elders and deacons there and they were questioning me about you know, my experience and so on and so forth and I was there with my wife. They wanted to know about her you know, if we were suitable for a particular work. So they'd ask me a lot of questions, you know, where have you served, where'd you go to school, what do you think on this issue, that issue, blah, blah, blah. And then they, they, they looked at Lee's, my wife, and they say, so what's your ministry? And she looked, you know, caught her on the spot. You know? So she looked at them and she pointed to me and she said, he's my ministry. He's my ministry. 
Now that doesn't mean she doesn't do things in the church, as you know, she's plenty busy doing a variety of things in the church, but she understood that at the heart of my own ministry, my own effort to serve the Lord, I needed her as a partner in that. And she understood that role. And I think that's contributed a great deal to our success, certainly uh, my longevity as a minister. You can't do this job if, you're not, if your wife is not for you and supporting you. You can't, you can't do it, not for very long anyways. So a lot of men you know, don't aspire to this great task of serving as an elder because their wives are either not suited to the demands or they're not spiritually mature enough to work with a husband who is an elder. I mean, there's no sin in that, it's just you know, you've got to have the partnership to really make it work. So the Bible doesn't deal specifically with elders' wives at any great length. There are the general ideas that if the elder is a sober-minded and a good husband, so on and so forth, a wife should you know, have the same kind of character. There is a specific reference in chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, let me read that, it says, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Now this particular passage here is sandwiched in between instructions regarding elders and deacons. So the, he's talking about elders, then, he, then you have this section here about women, and then he keeps going about deacons. So the conclusion is that the wives, because in the Greek the word is wives, refers to elders or deacons' wives, both sides, because you know, he talks about elders, specific qualifications, so on and so forth, different qualifications, different job for deacons, and right in the middle there's this passage about the wife. He just says the wife, and so we're assuming it's the wife of the elder or the wife of the deacon should have these qualifications. And this passage is also repeated and amplified in the book of Titus, or in the letter to Titus, where Paul gives even greater detail about the necessary characteristics of older women in the church, characteristics and responsibilities you know, that should be part of the elder's wife. So let's read Titus, shall we? In Titus, Paul says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may, be, uh, so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands. So Paul says three major things here about, I call them the elder women, the elder women, mature women, certainly the women who are married to elders. First thing he says, their conduct is reverent. So their behavior should be as such befits those who lead holy lives. Reverence, holiness. You can tell that there's something special about them because they are separated for the service of the Lord. Uh, it makes us think of the Old Testament priests. The Old Testament priests offered sacrifices before God in the temple and, and the holy place. And the idea was that since he came before God, his conduct among the people reflected his duties before God. And so the idea here about reverent conduct is the idea that the conduct should not contradict the office. The conduct should not contradict the office. So if you're an elder's wife and you have friends and so on and so forth and you've been an elder's wife for five years, let's say, and one day your friend's not in the church and then one day you say to one of your non-church friends, uh, they find out, oh, you're an elder's wife? And they go, really? I would have never guessed that. You know? <laughs> Don't take that as a compliment, okay? <laughs> Rather it should be, oh I figured. I figured, I figured as much. I knew there was something. I knew, I knew it. there had to be something, the way, that, the, the way that you conduct yourself. 
I mean, let's face it, all Christians are priests before God, offering their praise and service day and night to Christ. You know, that's what Romans 12 says, 1 and 2, Revelation 1, 6. We're all priests. We're not pointing out specifically only the elders got to act this way, only the elders' wives, of course not. But a mature woman's conduct should have the same spirit as this. Her conduct should reflect her responsibilities as an elder's wife. She is a priest of God in the same way. Uh, another thing he mentions about them uh, are two things that you don't see in them. So what do you see? You see reverence, respect for holy things. What you don't see in her behavior, well, not malicious gossip. Not only just gossip, malicious gossip. You know, the Greek word here is diabolos. Does that sound familiar? Malicious diabolos, meaning the devil. The idea is that gossip is the devil's work, for he accuses us before God night and day, and when we gossip, we participate in that accusation. You know, Christ is our defender, Satan is our accuser. When we're gossiping, when we're, you know, being critical of other people, sharing their weaknesses with other people, we're partners with Satan in accusing that person. And we know that this activity divides, destroys, displeases God for sure. I mean, you want to start a fight? <laughs> you want to start a fight in the church? Just go ahead and start. You know. And the idea about the elder's wife is that she is privy to so much information. I mean, you can't help it. You know, the, 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 the life, the ebb and flow of the life of the church you know, just runs past her all the time because her husband's at meetings, they have to, she, he is counseling this. You know, she, many times she can't help but know a, a lot more of what's going on in a congregation than just another member. And so it's very easy to use that information. And I think sometimes it's not malicious, it's just as a way of kind of unburdening themselves. But very, very, very dangerous. And Paul you know, warns about it. You know, the faults of others are covered by the blood of Christ, as are our own faults. So when we gossip, we refuse the blood of Christ for another person. We're saying, I, I'm not going to allow the, the blood of Christ to cover that person's faults. I'm just going to lift it up and I want everybody to see it, or at least I want you to see it. And here's the caveat that we normally use. right? We say, now look, I'm just telling you. <laughs> yeah. Somehow that minimizes it. I'm just telling you. It's just between you and me. Did you hear so-and-so? Right? We are uncovering what Christ has covered. So godly women, Paul says, have better things to do with their time than reveal and discuss the faults of other people. And then another thing you don't see in their life. Now, did I say she was perfect? Well, no. I said, you don't see that, meaning whether she has that fault or not, it's not to the degree where someone else will say, so-and-so, sister so-and-so, be careful what you say to her because it'll, it'll make its way around. So godly women have better things to do. All right, then he says, not addicted to much wine. Of course, wine was a common drink of the people at that time. Godly woman is not, not just not addicted to much wine, she's not addicted to anything. She's not addicted to Certainly alcohol, but drugs, prescriptions, uh, 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 shopping, uh, whatever. She's not addicted to, oh, am I stepping on toes? I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to shop. <laughs> the key word there is not wine, the key word there is addicted. She is in possession of herself. There's nothing else in possession of her. She's in possession of herself and herself is possessed by Christ, and only, and only Christ. So godly women are in control of themselves. 
Nothing controls them except Christ. And then Paul mentions, you know, he says, first of all, they're reverent. Here's two things you don't see about them. Then he says, and here's what you do see in them. First of all, you see them teaching things that are good, excellent. You know, when she speaks, it's not to gossip or to complain, but to teach what is good and what is noble. These women, he says, are able and busy teaching the younger women. They're not teaching the men, they're teaching the younger women. And then he describes that they themselves know and, and, and practice and now teach. You know, in other words, what do they teach these women? Well, they're teaching them to love their husbands and children. Really? Not just the fact that they should love their husbands and children, they're teaching those things that will help a younger woman to more love her husband and to more love her children. If you, if you raise children, it's an exercise many times in exasperation. It's exasperating and tiring. Someone says, and very guilt producing, raising children. I remember you know, we had four kids, all very close together. I was busy in ministry and you know, we, our house was like a nut house, you know what I'm saying? It was so, people in and out all the time. I remember one time, we're having breakfast, we're in our pajamas Sunday morning, we're having breakfast and the doorbell, and we lived like a street away from the church, it was a church house, and the doorbell rings. And there are three ladies from the church who had taken an early bus to church and they didn't want to wait outside. Could we just wait on your couch till church starts? This is like, more than an hour before services. And my wife said, well, okay. You know. And they were sitting there on the couch with their purses and all dressed and everything with their hands clasped. And there we were in the dining room in our pajamas having breakfast and the four little kids. And, <laughs> and there were some days you know, my wife was going, <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> And then Mrs. Branch, Sister Branch, Elder's wife, Macar uh, uh, MacArthur Park Church of Christ in Texas, our supporting and sponsoring church, came to visit, just they were from Montreal, not wherever, they had lived in Montreal previously, they came to visit and they came to see us. And I still remember Mrs. Branch, this, this marvelous lady, Elder's wife, putting her arm around Lee's. And she didn't say a lot, there was nothing, you know, there was no big revelation of any secret to parenting, because Mrs. Branch had raised five children. And she said, it's okay, Lee's. It'll get better. They won't always be small like this. They'll grow up. You'll, you'll be okay, you'll make it. That's all she said. And I remember Lee's just hanging on to those words, you know, those golden apples in silver frames, the right words spoken at exactly the right moment helped this young mother and minister's wife just kind of take a deep breath and just keep on going. Taught her how to not necessarily love her husband more, but how to, quote, love her children in the sense of be a little more long-suffering with the situation that she, was, that she was in. The older woman who has succeeded in maintaining a happy marriage, a satisfied husband, well brought up children, should be preparing younger women to do the same. Not criticizing them, not criticizing them, helping them. And you know what, even those who fail have something valuable to share through their experience. Not everybody succeeds at marriage. There are plenty of people in our congregation who are working at a second marriage, third marriage. You know, God is the God of second chances, third chances. He's the God that's brought us the good news. So don't think, you know, everybody, nobody's got the perfect marriage. But even those who have failed in some way can teach something, can share something. And then he says they're sensible and pure. 
And the words here mean a balanced thinking, not frivolous, not foolish, being sober-minded, someone who's not carried away by false teaching or the temptation to impurity or uh, 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 infidelity. You know, someone that's not easily you know, talked into something foolish, doesn't join the posse, I, I call it a posse. In the church, you know, somebody runs afoul of somebody else and then people choose sides. You know, I, I, think, I think divorce is usually the biggest issue. You know, unfortunately, a couple break up for whatever reason and then all of a sudden, uh-oh, we're picking sides. It's like dodgeball, you know what I'm saying? We're picking sides. Somebody is rounding up a posse to make the other guy the bad guy or the bad girl. And the mature woman, no, no, she didn't get roped into that kind of thing. Sober-minded, balanced, solid. What else to teach? To be workers at home. You know, the Bible is not against women working outside the home. There's some people that use this passage to say, that's why women should be at home, they're not allowed to, no. The Bible doesn't say women are not allowed to work outside the home. The point that he's making here is that women are not sluggish about the work that has to be done at home. In other words, if you're at home, you're a worker at home, you're working at home. The responsibility for the home, not the house, the home is the woman. She's the, the heart of that place. Older women are to encourage the younger women to this great task, to teach the things necessary to fulfill this ministry prop properly. You know, it's not a popular idea today. It's not politically correct, but it's biblical. And when, it, when it's obeyed, it makes for happier and balanced homes and marriages. You know, the reason I say she's not the heart of the house, because in the house, chores, you know, in my house, I do the ironing. Why? I like to iron. <laughs> I like it. I put the radio on, I get a cup of coffee, I don't have to talk to anybody, or I put my earbuds in, I got my you know, my phone with my music and I just iron away. I love it. I, I like to do that, cha that, that chore. I'm not crazy about cooking. So Lise does most of the cooking, but I don't mind cleaning up. Uh, you know, in other words, the tasks kind of fall where they may. The, the scripture is not assigning tasks to who takes care of the house, who mows, who cleans. No, the, the couple make up their mind depending on their schedule and the, so on and so forth, you know. But the home, the home, okay. Yeah, the woman, she's the heart of the home. And I think the great challenge to women who work outside the home is to balance that. Not necessarily to balance the chores, you can kind of negotiate that, to balance the idea of contributing enough of yourself to be able to be the heart of that home while maintaining you know, an outside job, career. So some people can do it well, others not able to. So women who love their children and husbands will maintain a proper home, whether it's a, you know, a one bedroom condo or a you know, 20 room house. This Paul says, is a first priority. Everything else is extra. You don't do the extra if this part isn't, you can't farm out being the heart of the home. You can't subcontract that out. Okay, you can't do that. And then he says, good and kind. First, of course, to husband and children. You know, sometimes it's easier to be good and kind to everybody else and only leave just a little bit left for your husband and your children. You know, people remember a woman's goodness and kindness long after they've forgotten her success or her looks or even her failure in the world. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt was the president's wife, but the thing they remember about her was her kindness. So older women, they teach by example. Younger women learn by watching. And then she, or he says rather, and submitted to their husbands, women submitted to Christ. 
or a woman who is submitted to Christ is submitted to her husband first, before her parents, before her job, her friends. Of course, it's a whole lot easier when her husband is a faithful Christian and he himself is submitted to Christ. So in the final sense, Paul says that this kind of behavior and teaching will honor God, Titus 2.5, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Why should she be this kind of woman? Why should she act in this way? So that God will be honored. The, the world judges the church by the character that the gospel produces in its people. Paul reveals the character of a godly, reverent, older woman and how she has become this way as well as what she is busy doing with her life. So there's no confusion what older women should be doing with their time. So we know that God has given the leadership role in the church to men who lead as elders, we know that. But He has described the kind of woman who can complement that leader in doing a good job in serving the church and honoring Him. Just let us finish up here. So what have we said? A woman who respects God and lives honorably and discreetly and soberly. A woman who is an example of gentleness and resourcefulness and strength. A woman who is not afraid to go against the grain of the world to retain her central position in the home and her special position next to her husband and children. A woman who can teach other women how to serve God and family and yes, even community. I mean, who wouldn't want to be married to that woman? Yeah, absolutely. Who wouldn't want to be married to that woman? I believe I'm already married to that woman and if I took a vote, I think you know, there'd be a lot of hands go up here. And I know that the women here in this congregation, and this is not an empty compliment, I've been here long enough to know, I know that the women here are godly women and that many of you are already doing the things that I've, I've merely held a mirror up to you already. And I know that many women in our congregation who don't necessarily serve as elders' wives are these kinds of women. And we're blessed because of that. So I do pray for our elders' wives that they might continue in their good work and example. And I also pray that God will move other women to grow and to follow their husbands into a greater life of service for the Lord. My wife inspires me. And again, that's not just an empty thing I'm saying. Because the, the, I can say a lot of things about Lise, you know, but one thing, because I only have a, a minute left, she is always eager to do good. Always, she's always anxious. Oh, that would be a good thing to do. You know? and, or somebody says, you know, well, we're needing donations for you know, money for, you know, for such and such good works. Oh, that's a great thing, let's give to that. And I'm, and I'm going, yeah, okay. <laughs> Come on, pull out your checkbook, let's go. I'm, I'm always a step behind her. I get to it. I'm, I'm like the guy, you know, the, the two sons, the one son who says, uh, no, I won't go, and then changes his mind and goes, you know, I'm that guy. But she, there's never a moment's hesitation to do a good thing. So she inspires me. She helps me to become a better person. And I think that's, that's how it should be in a marriage where partners are encouraging each other uh, spiritually. So I know we have many, many women like that in this congregation. It's one of the reasons why we have a growing congregation and one that's united. And the one thing that visitors say all the time, so friendly and so loving. Well, I think a big reason for that is the, the loving and mature women that we have in this church. All right, I think that's the time that we have for this morning. Thank you for your attention. We're going to move on to uh, deacons in our next lesson, so I encourage you to be there for that. Thank you. <laughs>